Well, hello there. Today I'm going to tell you about one of my favorite works of American literature, The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Published in 1860, the book was inspired by a trip that Hawthorne made with his wife to Italy in 1858. He was there for about a year and a half, and he was so struck by his experience there that he was inspired to write this beautiful book. The fawn he refers to is a very famous statue, the marble fawn by the great Greek sculptor from the fourth century BC, Praxiteles. So what I love about this novel is that the very first scene in it is actually something that I have personally experienced. He describes a scene where the four main protagonists, Hilda, Kenyon, Miriam, and Donatello, are at the Capitoline Museum in Rome admiring all the wonderful statues there in the sculpture halls. And I've seen these statues myself. My husband Jason and I went to Rome some years ago and we walked through those same sculpture halls and admired the same statues that they talk about in this book. So I really love that. It, it made it very immediate to me. I couldn't believe, I mean, the statues were even the same, in the same spots. It just shows you how ancient and sort of slow moving things are in Rome that statues that were there over 150 years ago and seen by Nathaniel Hawthorne and by the protagonist in his novel are still there now. So I, I really love that. So very, very cool. So basically it tells a story of four friends, Kenyon, who is an American sculptor, Hilda, who is an American painter and who's a very sensitive New England girl. Uh, Kenyon is sort of more of a rationalist. Hilda is supposed to be more of a sensitive and poetic type. Their friend Miriam, who is of unknown descent, but very, very beautiful and a very passionate painter, but with a very mysterious past. And their friend Donatello, who is the Count of Monte Beni, and who bears an uncanny resemblance to the marble font of Praxiteles. So it's a very, very interesting novel. Uh, a lot of it really revolves around the character of Donatello, the Italian Count. He's depicted as something of the natural man, as sort of like Adam before the fall. Uh, there are many, many interesting stories that, uh, that Hawthorne tells about how Donatello is sort of descended from the fawn and combines in himself qualities of both the animal and the human world. He is he's sort of an intermediate figure between the world of nature and the world of civilization. There are very touching uh, scenes where Donatello is shown calling to the birds and the animals and um, being able to speak a, a, a secret language with them. So it's very charming. So what is very cool about this is that there are a number of great themes in the book and I'll, I'll break them down into three main themes. First of all, uh, the book is really about Hawthorne dealing with his Puritan heritage and contrasting it with the world of the Greco-Roman tradition. And this is enormously important. In fact, this is something that many, many writers dealt with. You see this in you know, Goethe, the German writer Goethe, when he went down to Italy and he talked about his travels there, what a transformative role they had on him. I mean, many people would go to Italy as part of the grand tour, um, especially you know, English and, and Western European youth would go down to Italy or different part or in Greece and, um, and learn about you know, history and heritage and literature and art of ancient times and be very inspired by it. So for Hawthorne to go, he was, he was doing something that was a very familiar thing. He was going to Italy to learn about the old world. And, um, but it's also something that he turns into great literature because there is this great tension in the book between the world of his Puritan upbringing, which he saw as a world that was very dark, very gloomy, one laden with a sense of guilt and sin. And it was something that he personally um, really felt weighing down on him because of his family heritage. You see, Hawthorne himself was actually descended from one of the judges who presided at the Salem witch trials. In fact, his ancestor was the only judge who did not repent of his role in that awful travesty of justice. And that was something that really haunted Hawthorne. In fact, he changed his last name. His ancestor's name was actually Hathorne. Hawthorne added a W to even differentiate himself from this no notorious ancestor of his. And Hawthorne was raised in New England, he was raised in that Puritan environment, and it's something that he really struggled with his entire life. It's a theme in all of his stories, especially of course in his most famous novel, The Scarlet Letter. So you can see Hawthorne and his trip to Italy having this transformative effect on him, and he muses a great deal on the contrast between the world of the Puritans, the world of um, one would say Western and Northern Europe of the, of the Protestant Reformation and contrasting at it with the earlier classical Greco-Roman world, the pre-Christian world, the world of so-called paganism. 
and he has many, many um, very interesting reflections on that. So it is really all about the, sort of the, the meeting of the new world of America with the old world of Europe. It's about the clash between the Puritan upbringing that Hawthorne had with the classical Greco-Roman world that he sees in Italy and that he just comes to love so much, and that he sees a sort of a sunnier world, a happier world, a place of, um, of nature, of, of a unity between man and nature. My favorite scenes in it are the scenes in the Fawn's home in Monte Bene, up in the Apennine Hills, where Donatello's ancestors lived for many, many centuries, and where Donatello, who is identified with wine and grapes just like the fawn was, the fawns were who were uh, companions of, of Bacchus, the god of grapes, and there's a legend that Bacchus himself taught Donatello's ancestors how to grow grapes and how to make a really exquisite wine called Sunshine. It's very, very special. So Kenyon goes to Donatello's home, he enjoys this wine Sunshine, he hears stories of Donatello's mythic ancestry way back in prehistory from an actual fawn. And he goes around the countryside and he visits this lovely grove where there's a, there's a beautiful fountain and he learns of a beautiful story there about a nymph who came out of the fountain and who loved a knight who was one of Donatello's ancestors. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a beautiful and sort of poignant story around that. That's actually why I'm standing here by this statue. This is actually a statue from the early 1700s. It's Italian and it's of the nymph Arethusa being pursued by the river god Alpheus. And the Alp Alpheus is actually a river in Arcadia, in Greece, in the central Peloponnese. It's a very wild, mountainous area, and it's supposed to be the home of Pan and the, and the satyrs and the fauns. So the reference to Arcadia here is something that, to me, ties in with the theme in the book that Donatello's home is sort of like an Arcadia in the middle of Italy, and Donatello is like a wild, unspoiled fawn. He's somebody who's close to nature. He bridges the animal world and the human world. There, he doesn't feel a, a difference between himself and, 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 and the natural world, the animals, the plants, the trees all around him. And again, this is Hawthorne commenting on the fact that in, in, in the Bible, um, after Adam and Eve are expelled from paradise, they are sort of cut off from nature. So this is like Adam still in his state in, in, uh, in paradise, one with nature. He talks, he says that Donatello is not aware of good and evil. He is sort of before morality. He simply acts out of the kindness and the warmth and the generosity and the passions of his heart. Unfortunately, those passions lead him astray. He's in the world of human civilization. He's with people in a much more cynical, and some would say corrupt society of, of, uh, of Rome and, and these friends of his that he meets, like Dr. Um, Miriam and Hilda and Kenyon. So that is the first set of themes that's very interesting in the Marvel, in the Marvel Pond. The second very interesting set of themes is the role of the artist. Three of the main characters are artists, and the fourth character, Donatello, is, is the subject of their art. So Hawthorne talks a lot about famous works of art all throughout the Marble Fawn. They play a very important role. He's constantly comparing the characters to famous works of art that they resemble. Um, this is incredibly important, and it actually sort of portends a great deal of things that happen in the plot. And they're very, very sensitive to art. And so Hawthorne is all, as Hawthorne is part of the romantic tradition. So Hawthorne is always talking about, you know, how art uplifts your life out of the ordinary. That he, that the drab reality around one is transformed through art into a beautiful world of the imagination. So he sees art as uplifting, as transformative. And he sees even the ordinary artist as someone who is always striving towards beauty and towards the ideal. And therefore is, is a certain elevated being. So there are wonderful descriptions of the artistic scene in Rome in the 1850s, and it seems like these are probably events that Hawthorne and his wife went to, uh, meetings of artists, artists pouring over ancient drawings that they think might have been by Raphael or Da Vinci or Michelangelo himself, looking at old, you know, signet rings and inscriptions from Greco-Roman times, and being really, really inspired by all, all this, all the way to that uh, of the Greco-Roman tradition, but also the Renaissance tradition and all that artistry, and also the Baroque tradition, how all that artistry inspires artists in Rome, and really how it, above all, uplifts them from the world of the ordinary into the world of the ideal and the beautiful. So that's the second very important set of themes in the Marble Fawn. And the third set of themes that are so interesting to me um, is really more of a historical one. We learn a lot about what Rome was like at, in that era in the 1850s. We learn a lot about Roman history. And we also see how Hawthorne himself is starting a tradition, an American tradition, 
of American authors going to Rome and to Italy and being inspired to write great works of literature. So he, what he did with the Marble Faun very much inspired later writers, for example, like Henry James, The Portrait of a Lady. Of course, a lot of that is set in Italy and especially in Rome. And then later on, Edith Wharton wrote many of her famous works in Italy. She was very, very inspired by Italian culture. So there's a whole tradition that Hawthorne started of that as well. So I love anything that is a meeting of cultures, a mixing of cultures, so the meeting of America and Italy. By the way, my husband is Italian-American, so that's why I'm very interested in Italian culture, and I love learning all about it. So the meeting of America and Italy, of the old world and the new world, all those things really fascinate me, the sense of the weight of history, of how we can learn from history, but how we also try to break free from it to create something new. All these are themes in the Marble Fawn. I highly recommend it to you. It's a fascinating book, really worth reading, and one of my favorite works in American literature. Vista, it's also known as a Belvedere, it's just stunning. Okay, why don't we just show a little bit of it. And behind us is the Huntington Art Gallery. And this used to be the Huntington's Mansion, Mary and Arabella Huntington's beautiful home. Today it houses the European Art Gallery, it's such famous works as Pinkie and Blue Boy. One of my favorite places to go. It's absolutely stunning inside, and there's all these amazing European and Grand Manor portraits. Gorgeous Renaissance artworks upstairs. I absolutely love it.